Hey, Amy here, back with the final video for chapter 11. Uh, we're section 11.4, in which we look at things that don't follow sort of the typical Mendelian patterns of inheritance. One of the first things that we look at is what we call multiple alleles, okay? So for uh, when we looked at Mendel's pea plants, most of them had like a tall or short allele, a round or wrinkled allele, okay, a yellow or green allele. Okay, there were two alleles that controlled the trait. Uh, things with multiple alleles, just like the name sounds, uh, there's more than one allele or more than one variation of that gene. A uh, good example of that is the, our, <clears throat> the ABO blood types that we found find in humans. Okay, you have type A, <clears throat> which we use, oftentimes we'll use an I uh, with a little A on the top, an A superscript. Okay, the I is just referring that it is an autosome and that it's dominant. Uh, and also some uh, versus like an X or a Y chromosome where you might have an X link like color blindness is on the X chromosome. So we use X's and Y's. I's just mean it's autosomal. A allele makes A antigens on the red blood cells. And a B antigen uh, is found on the surface of the red blood cells. And if you have the recessive I, that's neither, so nothing, okay? Uh, and then you get different combinations of these, and I'll show you, and the body often has antibodies against the one it doesn't have uh, in the, as part of the immune system. And I'll show you this on the, uh, on the next slide. The ABO blood type is also codominance because the multiple alleles that are present are codominant. One is not dominant over another. A and B are both dominant over the recessive, which is no protein. But if you have, uh, if you have an A protein, and it's still just one gene, so you have an allele for A and an allele for B, you're going to have A and B proteins okay, on the surface of the blood cell. This graphic is just showing the ABO blood type. So uh, if you are type A, okay, so here's type A blood, uh, you'll see that there are A antigens represented by these circles, and you've got anti-B antibodies. Okay, so you'll see that these are more Y-shaped antibodies. Those fit the spikes of the B antibody that are more spiky. And again, it's not that way in real life. This is just a representation of how we could view that. And type B blood would have the anti-A antibody. Okay, if you are type AB blood, type B, uh, you have both antibodies, so you have no, or you have both antigens, but no antibodies. And if you are type O, you don't have O, meaning no, zero. You don't have any antigens, but you've got both antibodies. Uh, how is that often represented? Well, type A blood, you could have an A allele and an I, because that's dominant over recessive or no protein. Or you could have two A alleles. Type B blood, very similar. You could have two B alleles, or you could have a B allele and a recessive I, which is no, but you'd still have B proteins. Type AB, you're going to have, obviously, because it's codominance, you're going to have an A allele and a B allele. And type O blood comes from the two recessive little i, little i, uh, which means no protein. So if you look at this, type A blood uh, cannot get type B blood or AB blood because of these B antigens here that will react with the antibodies in the system and <clears throat> would cause a, a bad reaction. It would not be good, okay? Type B similar cannot have A or AB because of the anti-A antibodies. So these little circles here would react with those antibodies. Type AB, okay, can have any type of blood. Why is that? Why are they, we call them the universal recipient? Because there's 
no antibodies because they have both antigens. So they can get type A, type B, or type O, or from type AB. So if you're selfish, you really want type AB blood because uh, you can get your get blood from any any type of blood. Uh, type O, notice type O has no antigens on the surface. Okay, so not having antigens, it will not react. We call it the universal donor. Problem is it has both, it has both antibodies, okay, anti uh, B and anti A. So it can only get, can only have type O blood, okay? So when we talk about who can give blood to whom, uh, these A, B, O blood groups are very important. Uh, and this is used to, when we uh, need to do a blood transfusion or somebody lost a lot of blood, we know what type to give them based on what type they have. Another non-Mendelian inheritance pattern would be incomplete dominance. So co-dominance, like in blood types, if you had an A and a B, they would both show up. Incomplete dominance means one is not completely dominant over another. So this is the classic example, uh, like in snapdragon flowers, uh, where you have like a red flower and you cross it with a white flower and you get a pink flower. Okay, so red would have to have two red alleles. White would have to have two white alleles. But if you cross them and you get a red allele and a white allele, you get your pink. So your phenotype reveals your genotype because heterozygotes show a different phenotype than either of the homozygotes. And quickly, this is just a slide here showing that. So you have a red or a pink crossed with the pink, okay? Uh, if you get the one here is going to represent the red allele, R2 represents the white allele. So if you cross two pink flowers, you're going to get one fourth of a chance of red. You get your one to two to one ratio, one red, one fourth red, about two fourths or a half would be pink or heterozygotes and one fourth would be white. So instead of a mono hybrid cross, uh, the genotypic ratio, 1 to 2 to 1, is also the phenotypic ratio, 1 to 2 to 1. An example of incomplete dominance in humans would be familial hypocholesterolemia, uh, which is actually autosomal, autosomal dominant. Uh, in the last video, we talked about dominant versus recessive inheritance patterns. Uh, but in this case, if you are homozygous dominant, uh, you develop fatty deposits in the skin and tendons and uh, often have heart attacks at an early young age. And you need a lot of, uh, you need to watch this very closely. Um, whereas heterozygotes, if you have a normal allele uh, and then also a one for the hypocholesterolemia, the LDL cholesterol <clears throat> builds up, but not as bad. Uh, and so usually at a younger age, you're all right. But then as you get older, you really need to be careful of heart attacks. Uh, whereas homozygotes, if you have two normal alleles, uh, you don't worry about this. This is not as big a concern. Uh, it's more based on your diet and other genetic factors. Along the lines of kind of dominance and different kinds of dominance, uh, there's one that's called incomplete penetrance, okay? Penetrance poking through, okay? The dominant allele usually penetrates or it's like we say that it dominates the recessive. It covers up, it masks. Uh, sometimes that doesn't always happen. Uh, the dominant allele may not always lead to a dominant phenotype. Uh, if you've got like a heterozygote where you have big little, it may not completely, you know, cover up the recessive. Uh, many dominant alleles exhibit varying degrees of penetrance. Uh, how much this happens. An example in humans is polydactylism, uh, which I put pictures over here. This means extra digits uh, on the hands and feet. <clears throat> Some people just have an extra finger. So you should have one thumb, right? And four fingers so that you have five digits. Notice there's an extra. And this one here, this is a type of polydactylism where there's an extra middle digit. Uh, you can also have it where you have one, two, three, four, five, and you get kind of this 
a small digit here off the side. I knew someone from church, my youth group leader, uh, had polydactylism, uh, where it was just not really functional, but just kind of this small little finger off the side. Uh, and oftentimes, young kids and stuff now will have them surgically removed. Um, this is a dominant trait. It's also um, uh, associated with uh, dwarfism. Uh, so it's common in our area uh, because of the, the dwarfism trait uh, that's passed that was prevalent in the Amish communities. Uh, originally in Lancaster, PA, that moved into our area here. Uh, so this is, you know, more common than you think, and you may see examples. Uh, and this is incomplete penetrance. You might have a parent or someone who has this gene for polydactylism that it doesn't even show up. Uh, and then you get, you know, if you Google uh, polydactylism, you can actually get people that have got, you know, about seven, eight, ten different hand, different fingers on their hand. Uh, so you get this varying degrees of how this shows up. Another example is pleiotropy. Uh, pleiotropy occurs when a single mutant gene affects two or more distinct and seemingly unrelated traits. Okay, so an example, Marfan syndrome in humans uh, is a mutated gene on the FB, mutated gene FBN1 on chromosome 15, which codes for this protein. Okay, but not knowing that you would see multiple, you know, where is this fibrillin protein used? Well, in multiple places in the body. Okay, so the pleiotropic, uh, the pleiotropy results in looking at the phenotypes. It's not just, well, it messes up this. It messes up a lot of things. Long arms, legs, hands, feet, kind of a weakened aorta, uh, poor eyesight. Um, so if you're really long arms and legs, these tend to be really tall people. Uh, and they found that uh, one of the best U.S. Volley players, volleyball players ever uh, actually collapsed on the court at age 31 because of a weakened aorta, of a aneur aortic aneurysm. And uh, so if someone is a really good athlete and uh, they're really tall, have long arms and legs and stuff, they will actually check them for Marfan syndrome. Uh, to make sure that they're, they don't have problems with weakening in the walls of the aorta. But this one gene, okay, this one gene right here is pleiotropic because that gene then affects multiple different phenotypic outcomes in that organism or that individual. Uh, this is just a, another slide here kind of showing that. So here's that fibrillin, that kind of connective tissue. You know, how, what does that affect? Well, it affects the eyes. It affects the heart and blood vessels, skeleton, lung, skin, uh, heart and blood vessels, uh, skeleton. Uh, so just multiple different phenotypic sort of outcomes from having this messed up gene. And that's pleiotropy. The next one is polygenic inheritance, the prefix poly. Many of you know poly means many genes uh, control the inheritance. So far, we've looked at single gene traits. Uh, so, you know, tall, short, and everything you have, you know, bump, bump. You've got two spots uh, that you can have like a tall or a short. Or like if we're looking at the blood types, you could have multiple alleles, but they're still just... Ah, that's supposed to be an I with a B. Okay, there's still just two alleles. Okay, there's just one gene that's controlling the trait. Sometimes those things aren't so simple. They can be controlled by multiple traits, poly, many traits. Two or more sets of alleles and genes okay, that each contribute. And often it's a quantitative effect. The more you have, the more it affects it. Okay, they're additive. They build up. And what you get is this variation of phenotypes. Uh, if you remember from Bio 1, and we'll look at this again this year when we study the evolution unit, uh, you get your typical bell curve, okay, where you get uh, most are kind of in the average range, and then you get kind of less of like one extreme phenotype and less of the ex other extreme phenotype as well. And most are kind of in that average range. Uh, some examples are human skin color, height, eye color, and we'll look at some examples of this here in a second as well. This is just an example of polygenic inheritance, just kind of a general nothing in particular necessarily. Uh, you could maybe consider it like even skin color. Whereas if you've got one, two, three, four, five, six genes controlling the trait, 
Uh, if you have all, let's say, recessive, it would be a very light color, whereas if you have all six dominant, a very dark color. Uh, so you cross them, you get kind of medium colors, and then you cross them, and you can have anywhere from no recessive alleles all the way up to six recessive alleles. And so again, here's that bell curve, okay, where you get this wide range of phenotypes. And again, most people being of the average, this is proportion of population over here. So most people being of that average phenotype. Uh, this is another one looking at kind of the skin type where you've got uh, three genes. So three times two alleles for each gene, six alleles, uh, just kind of putting it to the skin color, skin type. And you can see any combination of a dominant gene. Okay, so there's one, two, three, okay, or just one. So if you have one dominant allele, it gets a shade darker. If you have two dominant alleles, a little bit darker, three dominant alleles, four dominant alleles, five dominant alleles, and then all six. Dark, 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 darker. So just the amount of melanin produced is dependent on how many dominant alleles are present. And so you get this bell curve, this wide range of phenotypes. Okay, that's all an example of polygenic, multiple genes. And again, like I said, this will become important when we talk about influences um, that happen that can cause types of different types of natural selection to happen uh, in the evolution unit. Another one is some environmental influ influences. Uh, we all know that you're not just totally genetics. Uh, you are genes plus factors in your environment. Uh, you could have genes to be really, really tall, but if you're malnourished and you don't get enough calcium to build nice, long, you know, tall, strong bones, uh, that can affect your height. Uh, and so there are the environment can play an effect on how those genes are expressed. Okay, uh, traits controlled by polygenes tend to be more subject to environmental influences. There's many genetic disorders, and your book lists a lot of them, like cleft palate, club foot, and on and on and on. Um, that when um, you know pharmaceutical companies, researchers uh, try to um, create therapies for this, uh, it makes it tricky for them because how does it affect a uh, certain male versus female? How does it affect uh, people of certain ethnic backgrounds? Uh, how does it affect you know, people that might smoke? How does it affect people that might have diabetes? You know, other conditions, how would that affect how their drug works for a certain condition? And it makes it a little tricky. You can't just make uh, one drug that will just work for everybody. It might work differently in different people. Uh, an example often used on standardized testing are the uh, Himalayan rabbits. Himalayan rabbits, uh, which actually their fur color responds to temperature. So these rabbits over here were raised at less than 20 degrees, and this was raised at above 20 degrees Celsius. And you can see uh, where it's nice and warm, okay, they're just white, all white. Okay. Whereas if they're raised at cooler temperatures, look, they get these black ears, nose, feet, tail. Why would that be? Why would the extremities uh, be where it's extra cold? When you go outside, what gets cold first? Tip your nose, your fingers, okay, your toes. Uh, why would it help being black? Yeah, absorb sunlight. When light is absorbed, it's changed to thermal energy. Okay, it would help keep them warmer. Uh, they've actually done research on this where they'll shave the back of the rabbit, place an ice pack on there to keep the temperatures down, and when the fur regrows, black spot. Okay, that is an environmental influence. The genes might be for white fur, but depending on the temperature, it could be white or black. Another interaction is the epistasis or epistatic interaction. Uh, this is cool because one gene can actually override another gene. You might have a gene for a certain trait, but if another gene over here at a different loci, a different locus says, oh, no, I don't think so, it can actually override what that other gene is saying. Uh, look up human eye color. Your book talks about a little, uh, little bit about human eye color and some of the, the two genes. 
Uh, if you start reading on the internet, you Google it, there's all kinds of interesting stuff. You know, the huge variation, it's not just uh, brown and blue, okay? You can have black eyes, uh, you can have blue eyes, uh, you can have hazel green eyes, uh, you can have brown eyes. Uh, because of this play of these polygenic trait of these different genes and certain ones can override other ones. And it's, it's a kind of, it's a very fascinating subject. Uh, another one, I love dogs. Uh, and my brother, brother-in-law raises uh, Labrador retrievers uh, and he has yellow labs. Well, how do you get a yellow lab? Well, you have black labs, okay, you have black labs, chocolate labs, and then you kind of have two forms of yellow labs. Okay, you have kind of your normal yellow lab, and then also what you call the Dudley, which is they're almost white. They're really, really light colored. Well, it can, turns out their coat is controlled by two genes, okay? So in the, the first gene, uh, the first gene is the black coat is dominant. So if they have a capital B, or if they have a dominant allele, any of these big Bs, okay, have any of these big bees, they're going to have black fur, <clears throat> okay? If they have, the only way you can have a chocolate lab <clears throat> is by having little b, little b, okay? But you also must have a dominant allele for this E gene over here, okay? So to have a, a chocolate lab, you have to have reset homozygous recessive for black or brown, and you must also have a dominant allele for the pigment, Okay, if you have a recessive, homozygous recessive for the pigment production, okay, then doesn't matter if you're big B, big B, big B, little B, little B, little B, you're not going to have that pigment in the coat and the hairs are going to look yellow or even in the case of the Dudley here, almost white. Uh, so kind of a, I always find this kind of an interesting, maybe it's because I'm a dog lover, uh, kind of an interesting topic. Uh, when we talk about epistatic interaction, about how one gene controls the other gene. You know, this says that should be a black lab. And then this gene says, oh, no, you're not because you're not, I'm not going to give you any pigment. Uh, and so that it ends up, um, ends up being a yellow lab. Another interesting thing that can happen if it's not an autosomal disorder that remember X and Y chromosomes uh, determine the male and femaleness in humans. Uh, the X chromosome is bigger. Uh, we're thinking 900 to about 1600 genes, whereas the Y chromosome, it doesn't actually look like a Y. It's just smaller and only has about 70 to 200 genes. Uh, that's where our sex determining region on the Y chromosome is at, the SRY gene. And that determines maleness. Okay. And during development, we kind of all start female. We usually hear that. And then when this SRY gene kicks in, that starts producing the androgen steroids and starts developing the male characteristics. Uh, the X chromosome actually contains a lot of other genes that are important for development because everybody has at least one X uh, chromosome. And so we get some uh, interesting inheritance patterns when there are, and this is showing uh, some of these mutations that we'll talk about, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, uh, fragile X, uh, hemophilia, uh, ADL. Um, I think your book mentions Menke's syndrome as well um, <clears throat> that are all located on uh, colorblindness are all Red, green color blindness are all located on this X chromosome. Uh, the term X linked is used for genes that have nothing to do with gender. Uh, it's just because they are on the X chromosome. Okay. Uh, the Y chromosome does not have these genes. It was first discovered by Thomas Hunt Morgan, uh, who was a big geneticist working with Drosophila melanogaster, our fruit flies. Uh, why fruit flies? They're small. They're easily raised. You can raise them in little glass tubes and feed them this like pasty green stuff. Um, we don't mess with that in our AP bio class. We use, just usually use the computer simulations for our genetics experiments. Uh, but it's interesting because fruit flies have the same sex chromosome pattern as humans. X, X for female and XY for male. And so they can actually, they studied some of these X-linked genes 
and they could apply them to how traits, uh, X-linked traits are passed in humans as well. Uh, one of those traits uh, that we often use in lab as well in our, our genetics, Drosophila genetics uh, simulators, uh, is this idea of white eyes, okay? Uh, white eyes is controlled by a gene on the X chromosome. Uh, the wild type is red eye. Uh, so if you cross a red eye male with a, or a white eyed, white, white eyed male, Okay, with a red-eyed female, you'll notice that all of the offspring are red eyes because they're, the males are going to get this X from the female and they get this Y from the male. So they, the males have to have red eyes. The females, however, are going to get the white-eyed X and then also a normal X. And so these will be what we call carriers. Okay, so in X-linked traits, females, females tend to be carriers, and it tends to show up if you cross them again, it tends to show back up in males. So it's more prevalent in males because males have an X and a Y, they only have one X chromosome. And if that X chromosome has the mutation, you got it, okay? And so it when we look at pedigrees, we'll see this. And again, I mentioned some of these. Uh, you can read more about these in your book. Uh, one near and dear to my heart is colorblindness. Uh, the red, the blue one, the blue, kind of the red blue one is autosomal. Uh, the one that I've got is the red green sensitive. You've got the protonope and the deuteronope. Uh, those are on the X chromosomes. Uh, you look at uh, little color plates like this. I mean, I can tell there's some green something going on there, but I can't see any number. You probably can, uh, which means you're not red, green, colorblind. I can't, so I, it's how I figured this out when I was in high school and we started looking at these color plates. Um, an interesting story, We, I, my first cousin, our, my, uh, our ma mothers, our sisters, uh, he noticed it as well, so we started talking. Uh, and we figured out it often skips generations. Our moms, so my mom and my aunt, uh, are actually carriers because my grandpa, who had passed away at the time, uh, but uh, my grandma said, yeah, he had trouble with colors and, you know, was never diagnosed. But we figured it out that my grandpa, okay, that my grandpa was colorblind, okay, and my grandma was normal. Uh, so I can just put, let's just put normal eye color here for the sake here. Uh, and so our moms got the X from my grandpa and a normal gene. So our mothers were both carriers. And when they married our father, our fathers, or my aunt and my uncle, uh, noticed that we had how much of a chance. Here's Hammy with colorblindness. What was the chance I got colorblindness? 50-50, depended which X I got from my mother. And I got the colorblindness X. He didn't win that lottery. All right. Uh, another one your book talks about is Menke syndrome, a defective allele in the X that disrupts uh, the movement of copper in and out of cells. Uh, it, it's called kind of called the kinky hair syndrome, poor muscle tone. Um, oftentimes... The kids don't live much past the, you know, five years old. Uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, especially Duchenne's or Duquesne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, it's one we often learn about in Bio 1 uh, when we look at uh, human disorders, genetic disorders. Uh, causes the wasting away of the muscle. Uh, and it's, it doesn't have the, the protein dystrophin. Uh, and calcium tends to build up and the muscles tend to lock up. Uh, and, and oftentimes, you know, the, the prognosis from this life expectancy is not much past 18 to 20 years old. Um, ADL, adrenal leukodystrophy, or sorry, ALD, as it's sometimes called, is an excellent recessive disorder, disorder. And it's a failure of the carrier protein to move an enzyme or very long chain fatty acid into peroxisomes. Again, life expectancy, not that well. Uh, kind of the famous one is the hemophilia. 
uh, or the bleeding disease because they are missing certain clotting factors uh, and the blood does not clot very well. And we'll look at a famous example of this here in a second. First though here is just how do we recognize an X-linked disorder on a pedigree. Last video we looked at this a little bit. Uh, you'll notice right away that more males are affected than females. Can a female have the disorder? Most certainly. Uh, you would have to have an affected male and a carrier female or male that's affected in order to have a female offspring or have a daughter that is also affected. Uh, but it happens. Uh, you'll notice that it often tends to skip generations. Okay, so this would be my grandpa John right here. Uh, this would be my mom Linda right here. And down here is the grandson Hammy. So grandpa, grandpa's daughter tends to be a carrier and then grandson, it shows up in the grandsons again. So it tends to skip generations. And also, interesting point down here, if a woman actually does have it, all of her sons, all of her sons will have it because she will pass on that X with the mutation or the disorder onto the son. They'll only get the, the Y gene from the father. Uh, the famous example of this, uh, hemophilia and why we know a lot about it uh, is because um, of the, it's often called the royal disease. Uh, Queen Victoria was the first of the royals to carry the gene. Uh, it may have been a spontaneous mutation or something that happened. Well, you know, the royals, the royal monarchs and the monarchy families tended to marry other monarchs. And so you had some inbreeding of cousins and so forth. And so it just spread through the royal families of Europe. Uh, through marriages that happened between the English, the Spanish, the Prussian, Russian royal families, uh, and all the way down to uh, Nikolai and all those. And so because that was uh, kind of with these prominent families, it's very highly studied and who they think had it and who didn't. Uh, nowadays, <clears throat> you often take injections of clotting factor uh, that your body can't produce uh, and there are ways to kind of treat this disease. And many people are very active and healthy, uh, even though they have hemophilia, because we have better ways to treat it. And finally, on the last slide here, we just kind of see an interesting uh, pedigree of how much work has been, has been done with this, going all the way back to Queen Victoria. Um, well, actually, this is Queen Victoria, okay? Queen Victoria had a daughter, Queen Victoria, uh, where this mutation first happened. So you see if it's shaded half and half, uh, that means that she was a carrier female. Okay, so then you look at daughters, one, two, three, four, five daughters, okay? And one, two, three sons, okay? And you start looking at, oh, as you follow this down, okay? So here, her daughter, Alice, married Louis IV, okay, and had lots of kids, right? Uh, here's Nikolai II, who then she, one of their daughters married Nikolai II, uh, and Alexei, uh, who had this trait. And you see, ooh, you see some interactions here of uh, first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, uh, that are marrying, and you just see a lot of this hemophilia trait uh, moving down through the generations. Uh, and it was kind of, kind of interesting to follow. And again, if you want to do some more reading, uh, it's sort of an interesting story of this genetic disorder. So, sorry, kind of a long video, but that was a lot to explain of non-Mendelian things. Uh, so I hope that helps. If you have any questions or anything, make sure you ask in class. Otherwise, we're done with chapter 11, and uh, we'll prepare for this test. And it's handy. Out.